you for that amazing praise and worship session. It really touched me, especially the part where it says, uh, test and see, and, the, and that you see that the Lord is good. And if I'm not yet dead, he's not done. To be honest, that was like, wow. It's just food for thought for me to say, if I'm not if I'm not dead, God is not done with me. He still has a lot to do in my life. He still has a lot of blessings that he, he, he is a store for me. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, since we are getting into our communion and offering message to be de uh, delivered by Sister Scar. Sister Scar, are you ready? I'm ready. Hi, Letty. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Looking so I'm radiant you. today. <laughs> so do you, eh? <laughs> Hi, church. How are you? How's everyone? I trust all are in good health and are prospering. Um, I'll just get right into it. Today, my communion message is, um, I'm titling it, The Aftermath of the Cross. So I'll ask uh, for the slides. Okay. okay. Should I read for you? Yes, please. Okay, Isaiah 53 verses 3 to 6, then 11. Not sure who I am sending this to. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows. I acquainted with grief, deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of all. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. Amen. Amen. Um, I really wanted to just zone in on um, where it says um, he was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Um, when he sees all this is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. So for me, um, God was just leading me to satisfied. I, I was stuck on satisfied for a bit and I was trying to work out satisfied. Okay, um, what does it mean? What is it exactly after all this? And then we have satisfied, you know? So I, I looked at different translations. Um, I looked up the word satisfied. It means filled with joy, content, pleased, worth it and be glad there's a um i'll read it from the from the i'll read it from the message it says um still it was what god had in mind all along to crush him with pain the plan was that he give himself as an offering for sin so that he would see life come from it life life and more life um i'll just stop there so tying what i'm trying to what um what we just read what jesus went through how you are supposed to be satisfied when he saw what um, it would come out. What would come out was life, life, and more life. And God's plan would deeply prosper through him. So the aftermath of the cross, why I called um, my message the aftermath of the cross is because once Jesus went through what he went through, there was an expected end. As you can see, there is a satisfaction that needs to be uh, played out. And there's more and more life that needs to be um, to be to be seen, and that's now on us as saints and having us understand what Christ paid and did for us. He went through the most. He went through so much anguish, so much pain. If you read through it, you can see that it was it wasn't a good time. But as he was going through that, he had a expected end, which was to be satisfied, to see us living joyous, fruitful life. Um, it says. Um, Therefore, it says also here, through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant will make many righteous ones. So for us, it was 
the glory of seeing us as righteous, seeing us walking in what Christ has done for us, in what he has done on the cross. He went through so much. And um, as I was just playing it out in my mind, I kept thinking of my child, my son, Nathan. And I was thinking, hey, you know what? Um, if it was him bearing this and then seeing him, I would love to see the end result of what he went through, you know? Like, for example, we pay school fees for our kids. Where the end result is a good education and a good job. So it always sat, brings satisfaction when you see your child walk, walking in that, walking and saying, okay uh, he's prospering he's of good health he's 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 um he, he doesn't have to suffer anymore and that's the mindset god had for us when when jesus was going through all that he had he had um a prosperity he had um a healthy mindset he had good good plans that's why it says in jeremiah 29 verse 11 for i know the plans that i have for you plans to prosper you because he saw this as much as jesus was going through that for us he saw us walking in prosperity. And as we do that, as in health, in good health, and it made me get angry for when the devil attacks us and wants us to be sick, to be angry, to be, um, you know, when, when we have death, sicknesses, poverty, like it's no longer ours, saints. It's not ours anymore. Christ paid for it in full. We have the receipt. So we have every right to walk and to remember that this is the mindset that God has for us. So we, 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 we tend to embrace certain things. I mean, it's, it's probably because of what's going on in our country and the like. We embrace, ah, oh, you know what? I have to struggle to pay fees. I have to struggle um, to, I have to struggle for help because the healthcare is bad. But no, it, it, it's, it's not that because God has made a huge provision for us to prosper and be of good health. He, he, he says in his word that um, um, I'm perfecting everything that concerns us. And for me, that verse also came to life because he, on that cross, Jesus perfected everything that concerns us, you know, he made sure that we were taken care of, that our lives are just going to be joyous, you know, it's, um, I'll take you back to that verse that uh, we just read, where he was saying, um, joy and more joy, like you could tell that as he was, as this person, as, as I was writing this, he could play it out, seeing us walking righteous, seeing us walking free of sickness, seeing us walking in prosperity. And that's the picture I really wanted to, to leave with you, that there's a satisfaction that comes with receiving what Christ did on the cross. And as we walk it out, saints, as we go about our day to day, we need to remember that because of what Christ went through, we live to see the greatness of God. We live to see the good things of God because that's what the cross has brought us. Um, we have to remain in constant awareness of this. You know, I'm not saying this out of condemnation, but I'm just saying that we need to remember that there's a satisfaction that, you know, you want your child to, you want, you want your child to prosper. And you all, you, you all want your child, your children, sorry, to prosper and be of good health. And you've made um, plans for that. And when you see your child not prospering and not when they have the solution in front of them, when they have the word, when they have what Jesus does, you, 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 you can't say you're satisfied. And this is what I'm just wanting us to really zone in on. Kuti, you know what? God did his part. He played his part. He gave us Jesus. Jesus died for our sins. He went through all this anguish. It's now on us to remember and receive and acknowledge and then also walk it out so that that good and perfect plan is played out in our lives and it comes and how we work it out is just refusing it's getting angry at anything that has to that comes to steal kill and destroy because it's not from god and god has worked out an amazing plan for us he's he, he's just now just sitting back and saying okay my kids run it go for it why because he has he, he gave us jesus we saw what jesus went through and we have the word to show us so let's get into the word if you come through a, if you come if you're going through a situation where you are failing to understand or see the goodness or know does you know does this satisfy god is this going to satisfy god then go back to the word guys go back to the word and say okay mari please show me show me where exactly i can um I, i'm lacking or i'm not um, living out the best because I know in your word you've made everything possible for me to prosper. You've made everything possible for me to excel in this area. You've, if it's health, for example, if it's your mental health, if it's whatever, there's always a solution that God has already given us, and that's in the word. So we have to go back to the word, go back to the Holy Spirit, and ask Him. Okay, listen, 
I'm, I'm failing with Jimanya on this area in my life, okay? I'm failing to understand why I'm struggling with sickness, why this pain keeps coming back. Um, get angry. Righteous anger um, availeth much because when you get angry, you are able to then see. But, you know, Jesus didn't go through all this for me to sit back and then have a sore back. Or Jesus didn't go through this for me to lack in this area. He didn't. He went through because he could see. He was satisfied. He was filled with joy. He was, he, he was, he has an expected end. He's expecting to be content, to be pleased, um, and be worth it and be glad. So, Saints, I'm um, I'm I'm just really here to just take us to that, to that thought, Kuti. Be be bold. <laughs> be bold and go forth for everything that God has given us. Find out on, in the word what exactly, what area of my life am I facing some challenge? Why am I facing? Is it my sickness? Is it healing? Is it, what is it? Is it prosperity? God has already made provision for it and we have the receipt. It's our turn now to walk it out. Um, and this is through just acknowledging and accepting and then also realizing that whatever comes, it's not from God. So it's to rebuke, to send it away to get angry and to just remember that Christ paid for it and he's expecting an, a, a good end for us. He has already made provision for that and ours is just to walk in it. So um, I will have us take our communion and acknowledge our receipts and just, um, you know, zone in on the Holy Spirit and ask him to show you which area of your life that you need to actually um, bring forward, you know, bring forward to, to Christ, bring forward and say, where exactly can I show um, your love? Where exactly do I need to bring out my receipt and show it as proof to say, here's the proof of what Christ did for me. He didn't go through that uh, in vain. He went through that for us to live a prosperous, healthy, and a righteous life. Okay, so we can take our communion. And I'll just pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the finished work of the cross. We thank you that we're able to walk boldly in this life, in this current life, knowing that you've perfected everything, that you have given us everything, that you have um, secured our receipts. We thank you for good life. We thank you for uh, prosperity. We thank you for good health. And we just thank you and exalt your name because we know that you are a good, good father and you have good, good things for us. So today, as we take this communion, I'm just um, sealing the deal. I'm just literally agreeing with you, agreeing with the saints that you have completed the work. And it's our turn to now walk out that glory, walk out in confidence, knowing that you have done all that you can for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Um, so now I want to just take us out. Um, my, my communion, my communion message also just is a continuation of my um, my giving message. Uh, I really wanted us to. I'm um, tight. <laughs> I know you. You probably think, ah, this girl is titling things, but um, I wanted to just give it a title. Um, that's a, a Holy Spirit giving. I'll call it the Holy Spirit giving because you know when I was thinking of what to share. Um, God just led me to uh, for the different types of giving. There's different types of giving in the Bible. And I grew up uh, in a Baptist setting and giving to us was money. <laughs> it was literally just money. If you're going to give, give money. Um, that was our type. And as I continued to follow, um, as I continued in the word and as I continued to read, I realized that there are so many types of giving in the word of God. And there are some that we actually don't really um, lean on because we tend to always think when I'm asked to give, it always has to be money. Yes, it has to be money because the church has to run, definitely. So yes, money is needed. I'm not refusing that. But I'm also say, saying if we can also tap into the Holy Spirit kind of giving because this gives us an opportunity to give in other means and ways. You know, there's there's nothing as um, timely or as as for me, um, if when someone comes, it doesn't have to be money. When they know in particular what is in my heart that I need or that I am facing, and they come and they deal with that particular thing, and my sister Faith has a gift for that. Um, she would just, I don't, she would just do something that has nothing to do with 
what I'm currently needing or whatever, but it has everything to do with where I need to be in my spirit and something that I would have been praying for and talking to God about. And then she just comes and she just blesses me. And it just really um, gives me a peace. And a, 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 I call it the Jesus effect. It, it, it makes me realize, oh, you know, Jesus works through people to get things done. He doesn't work through, um, you know, he doesn't come, okay, he doesn't come and sit and say, okay, now I'm going to do this. He works through people. And he, in relationship is when you can be able to um, access a bit of uh, what Christ has for you. So, for example, if we, as saying, uh, if I want to bless Letty and I want to find out, okay, Letty, where are you? I want to bless you and I want to, um, you know, give into your life. I will ask the Holy Spirit and I'll say, Holy Spirit, what is it that I can give Letty? Is it money? Is it uh, time? Is it um, fun? What is it that she needs that I can bless her with? And it's even with the church, for example, our church. What is it that the church might need? That's not maybe um, money or whatever. Is it time? Is it giving of my, my, my preaching? Is it giving of revelation knowledge? Is it passion, devotion? What is it that is currently at, at a need that I can supply? And only the Holy Spirit can, can you know, can give, give that. I'll have, let you read for us 2 Corinthians 8 verse 7. You do well and excel in every respect, in unstoppable faith, in powerful preaching, in revelation knowledge, in your passionate devotion, in sharing the love we have shown to you. So make sure that you also excel in grace fueled generosity. Amen. Amen. Amen, saints. So I, I really um, want to zone in on the grace filled generosity. And I'm just challenging you again that as you go through your week, uh, grab or get a hold of the Holy Spirit and ask Him to reveal to you how I can be a grace filled giver. How can, how can I give? A grace-filled generosity, and he will blow your mind. I've been, you know, looking and um, experiencing this over some time. Asking him, okay, what is it that I need to do for? If it's Kelly, if it's my son, what is it that's not? What is it that I can give to someone that can bless someone that has nothing to do with maybe what I think they need? As you always know, there are needs that you think someone needs. But sometimes the Holy Spirit can actually just give you an idea of what to give and how to give. So essentially, I'm just um, saying, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in your giving. Allow him to show you the channels because he, um, it says he will light up your path. He will direct your steps. So use, you know, lean on the Holy Spirit and ask him, do I need to give a word of knowledge? Do I need to give monetary? What else can I give? apart from just um, what I usually do? Is it directed by the Holy Spirit? Is it directed by just the fact that I know this is what's needed? What is it driving my giving? And um, I'll close with this first. Um, uh, let you can read it for me. It's 2 Corinthians 9, 7 to, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 to 9. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving. All because God loves hilarious generosity. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you have more than enough of everything. Every moment in every way, he will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do. Just as the scriptures say about the one who trusts in him, because he has sown extravagantly and given to the poor, his kindness and generous deeds will never be forgotten. Amen. Amen. Amen, saints. So I end with that. And I just end with that verse just to, um, just to say uh, God loves a cheerful giver. And when you give from your heart, when you give with direction, when you give, it blesses him and it satisfies him. So I'll ask um, our technical to just put our giving. Yes, our our account numbers, our payment details, and then you can go ahead. And
Amen. Sense. Let me just pray for our giving. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for all those that gave. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to give to your work. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to, to bless your church and be blessed by you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Scar, for that uh, message. For sure, we need to let the uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. I'm just going to read a couple of messages from our chat. Um, from the WhatsApp chat, uh, Mrs. Montgomery is saying, I'm satisfied. Thank you, Scar. Then from the Zoom chat, uh, Kelly is saying, Amen. We had an expected end, which was for us to live a wholesome life. And then finally saying amen to an abundant life. Uh, Miss Montgomery is saying Jesus is satisfied. The father, the father is totally satisfied with me. I guess the question turns is, uh, am I satisfied with Jesus? That's a question she posed for us. Then Mr. Shenjie is saying, our Lord help us to always excel in grace filled generosity and amen's car. Then Mr. Amek is saying Proverbs um, 9, 19 verse 7 says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and you will repay him for his deed. Thank you, thank you saints for those comments. Thank you for that verse. Indeed, let us lend to the Lord. I think he's a good repair. <laughs> uh, saints, we are getting uh, to our main message. It's a series we started a couple of months ago, but we had a break. Then now we are resuming it. Uh, the series is called The Seed is the Word and the Word is the Seed. It's going to be delivered by Mrs. Mack. Mrs. Mack, are you ready? Yes, I am. Good morning, Letty. How are you today? Morning, morning. Looking good in pink. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you're looking good too. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can take it away. Okay. Thank you so much. And welcome to all of us, all of those, all of our family who are joining us on, um, on the Zoom platform, on Facebook, on um, YouTube Live. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are really hoping you're having a, you've had a great week and that you are going to have an even greater week going forward. Yes, we are touching base again after a bit of a, a break. Um, we are coming back to our series, The Seed is the Word and the Word is the Seed. And like Leti said, we started this a while ago, a long while ago. Uh, uh, and today, the title, the subtitle of today's session is The Ground, the Womb, and the Heart. The Ground, the Womb, and the heart. So we'll go back to our anchor scriptures just to recap on what we have covered so far. One of the anchor scriptures is Mark 4, verse 14, which really directs us to the word as the seed that God has to sow, is the only seed that God can sow, can ever sow in our hearts. Mark 4, verse 4, 14, um, it must convince us that the sower, who is God, only sows the word. Can you read it for us in the various versions, Letty? Okay. Uh, in the New King James Version, it says, the sower sows the word. Then in the Amplified, it says, the sower sows the word of God, the good news regarding the way of salvation. In the TPT, let me explain, the farmer sows the message of the kingdom. And in the message, the farmer plants the word. Amen. 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 So in that passage of scripture, God is really just wanting to remind us that he is the sower in his kingdom. He is the sower. He is the only sower. And the seed that he sows is his word. So God is saying to us today, he is sovereignly determined that in his kingdom, he is the sower and the word is his seed. The word is is his seed. So the sower sows the word. Our next anchor scripture is Luke 8 verse 11, which uh, talks about the same thought. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's teaching us the same principle concerning the seed being the word of God in the kingdom of God. Let if you could also read it in the various translations for us, please. Thank you. In the New King James Version, it says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. 
in the Amplified. Now the meaning of the parable is this. The seed is the word of God uh, concerning eternal salvation. In the TPT, here then is the deeper meaning of my parable. The word of God is the seed that is sown into our hearts. In the message, the story is about some of those people. The seed is the word of God. Amen. Amen. Again, here Jesus is emphasizing that in the kingdom of God, the seed is the word. So God is the sower. His seed is the word. Um, we, we want to just keep this at the forefront of our minds all the time. And every time we have an interaction with the word, whether we are reading from the Old Testament, we are reading from the law and the prophets, we are reading from the uh, gospel dispensation, or we are reading from the epistles, um, we must just remember that everything that we are reading, everything that we are uh, ingesting from the word of God is seed. It's seed that God wants to use to sow him of himself in our hearts and to be begin to experience whatever the word of God tells us concerning any situation in our lives. And then we went on to start, uh, we studied uh, for a for, for a bit, the princi this principle of the seed as it runs the kingdom of God. And we, next slide, please. And we said that the kingdom of God works off the seed principle. Uh, it, it, it doesn't work off any other principle except the seed principle. This is what Jesus is trying to tell us, that the kingdom of God runs on the principle of the seed. It runs on this principle of seed, time and harvest. It runs on the principle of every seed bringing forth of its own kind. It runs on the pr principle of the seed being the word of God. And because the seed is the word of God, we separated or we established some key or essential components of this seed principle as the basis or the foundation on which the kingdom of God runs. We separated six um, principles or six, six components or six um, uh, points that this seed principle works off of. The first principle that we considered was the, the principle of the sower, that if there is seed to be sown, then there must always be the sower. And in the kingdom of God, God is the sower. He is the farmer. He is, he is the gardener of our hearts. He is the one who sows into our lives. And he, he, he is the one who brings the seed of the word that is sown or planted being the word of God in our hearts, the gospel of Jesus Christ as we as we know it and the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is taught right from the beginning of the word of the Bible to the end of it, we establish that it's all about Jesus Christ. And we have established that God has used the seed of the word of God to sow into the hearts of men in the various dispensations of the history of man in which God related to man in different ways. So God has always used the word as a means by which to relate to the man that he loves, the mankind that he created. It is the only means by which God has, can influence our lives, can renew our minds and transform our lives to conform to what he purported or what he planned for us in this life. So that was aspect number one or principle number one and principle number two. Today we get to start on the principle or essential component number three, which is the ground. And that is the ground which brings forth from the seed which God sows in our hearts. So the sower is God, his seed is the word and our hearts are the ground. After we've completed the ground, we are going to talk about the time that we must allow for this seed to, to take root, to germinate, and then to grow, uh, and then eventually bring forth fruit. We have to allow that time. That is how God has designed his kingdom to work. We have to allow the seed an element of time so that it can grow and increase and give us a mighty harvest according to God's perfect design. The fifth element is the water or the nourishment that this seed of the word of God is going to need in order to germinate, in, uh, in order to grow, and in order to deliver after its own kind in our lives. Then the sixth and final element is the Lord who causes the increase or who brings the harvest. So the process, the way the kingdom of God works is that God starts it as the sower and he finishes it as the giver of the harvest. And in between, point number one and point number six, 
our cooperation is needed. First of all, to allow that seed to settle in our hearts, to allow it time to grow and to develop, to continue to nourish it and to, uh, and to water it by the many different exercises or principles that the word is going to teach us so that we can get to the point where God can bring the harvest that he has assured us of. And so uh, by way of a recap, we established that in our lives, it's all about two sowers or two gardeners, two seed types and one garden or one steward gardener. The two sowers that we spoke about um, the sower in the kingdom of light or the kingdom of God, and that sower is God, we've just read from Mark 4, verse 14. And then there's another parallel kingdom, which is the kingdom of darkness. The king of that kingdom is the imposter gardener who is Satan or the devil, and he's the sower in that kingdom. His seed is the lies that he tells. And we, I think we went through a number of scriptures where Satan sold lies to people who had received the word of God and who were supposed to just keep it and uh, remain faithful to it in order to get to the place of harvest that God assures. So we are talking about two parallel kingdoms here, the kingdom of light in which God is the honor gardener and the kingdom of darkness in which Satan is the imposter gardener. And right in the middle of the two gardeners is, uh, is myself and yourself, the steward gardener, the one who makes the choice or the one who chooses which gardener um, uh, takes precedence in our lives. So God is the sower in the kingdom of light. He sows the seed, which is the truth of the word of God. He sows it into me, in men's heart, which is the garden of God. And um, th that seed must remain in our hearts through time. And then uh, it must grow and increase as it is watered and as it is nourished. Uh, supernaturally by, by the water of the word of God, by the Holy Spirit, by uh, as we continue in fellowship, etc, etc. And then finally, God gives the harvest of that seed by way of the blessing that of the Lord that makes rich without adding any sorrow by way of the of life in all its abundance, by way of the peace that surpasses all understanding that we continue to increase by way of prosperity all round prosperity in every aspect of our lives. So that is how the kingdom of light will work. But the parallel kingdom works along similar, similar principles, except that the seed that is sown is the seed of lies, it's a seed of deception. It's a seed that is also sown in the heart of men. It grows and increases as, as it is watered and nourished by the world, by, by the lies that the world tries to peddle, by the deception that comes from the world. And then the result of it, the result that Satan, the imposter gardener, guarantees is that the curse will manifest in our lives, corruption, death, in all its forms, in all its incipient forms, from sickness, from lack, from emotional um, uh, instability, from all those things that we know that are not of God that happen in our lives. Those are the results of the seed of the imposter gardener who is Satan. And right in the middle of, of the two gardeners, the gardener of the kingdom of light and the gardener of the kingdom of darkness is the steward gardener, that is you and me. We get to cast the vote on which of the two gardeners will, we will allow to influence our hearts and our lives. So we get to choose between Satan and God. We get to choose between uh, the seed of truth and the seed of life, of, of lies. We get to choose between um, the, the, sower, uh, the sower who sows into our lives and the harvest that comes with that sower. So we are, the, we are right in the middle, casting the vote on whichever gardener we choose to allow room in our hearts. So we are the stewards of our hearts and whatever grows in our hearts is what we have allowed either the, the owner gardener or the imposter gardener to plant or to sow in the garden of our hearts. So that is by way of a summary what we have covered so far. And so today we're going to start on the ground, that, which is uh, uh, principle number three, the garden, uh, the garden or the ground or the earth on which the seed is sown. So to help us understand the importance of our hearts in the seed system or the seed principle by which the kingdom of God uh, runs, God in his word gives us two, um, two, what, what, two examples, or he, he gives us two pictures or types and shadows to just explain how our hearts work in, uh, in tandem with the seed that is sown in them to bring forth 
of the of of the seeds on kind in various aspects of our lives. So God gives us these two examples. He gives us the earth or the ground uh, which brings forth. And he also gives us the womb of a woman, which also brings forth. So he gives us these two examples so that we can really understand how his kingdom works and we can begin to cooperate with this, with, with the kingdom of God, with the seed principle in the kingdom of God, as we understand how the earth works and how the womb of a woman works to receive seed, to, to, to allow it to incubate uh, either in the ground or, or in the womb and eventually to produce a harvest of crop in the ground or a harvest of a child in the womb. And God is telling us today that our hearts will work to the extent that we understand these two principles to be at work in our life. So if we can understand how the ground gets to bring forth of a mighty harvest, if we can understand how the womb can get to bring forth a child, a son or a daughter, then we will be able to better understand how our hearts can also in like manner bring forth a life that is of the God kind in our day to day. And so we are going to study the two, these two components, the, the, these two examples, the earth and the womb, and we're going to establish how they get to the point of giving forth so that we can also understand how our hearts were created to eventually give forth of whatever seed we allow to be planted uh, in them. So we are going to go to the beginning. I always like to go back to the beginning. I always like, like to start from the beginning because that reminds me that God has not changed. God has never changed. God will not change his, his principles that worked in the beginning still work today. And if the word was the seed, it was the seed in the beginning, then the word remains the seed even today. And if I can understand how the word was the seed in the beginning and how it brought forth a harvest right in the beginning, then I can apply it to my life today, I can start to sow and expect a certain harvest according to God's word in like manner. So we are going to go back to the beginning, Genesis 1, verse 9 to 12. We are, we are, we are talking about the earth, the womb, and the heart, the three. We are comparing the three so that we can really understand how the seed of the word of God can bring forth a harvest if we allow it to be planted in the ground of our hearts. So today, we are going to just consider those two aspects, those two um, those two life principles that we deal with day to, on a daily basis so that we can really understand the spiritual truth that is hidden in these physical realities that we handle every day, the earth and the womb. Genesis 1, verse 9 to 12, Letty. Thank you. And God called the dry land earth, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the tree and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it, it, it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then yeah. in the NLT, and God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed bearing plant and trees that grow seed bearing fruit and the seeds that will produce the kinds of trees and uh, the kind of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. And the Lord and the land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed bearing plants and the trees with seed bearing fruit, the seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Amen. Amen. So we see here God planting the first garden in the Garden of Eden. At that time, he had created the heavens and the earth, but there was no plant life on earth. There was no animal life on earth. And now God is beginning to, to, to create the plant life and the animal life as we know it today. And what does God use? He uses his word. The Bible says, God spoke and he said, let the earth bring forth grass 
And then we hear the result of that spoken word. The Bible says, and the earth brought forth grass. In the NLT, it says, God spoke and it says, let the land sprout to vegetation. And then the result we see, the land produced vegetation. And so in the first creation, before there was any tree, before there was any shrub, before there was any plant life on earth, God spoke. He spoke into the to the earth or he spoke into the ground and he instructed the ground to bring forth grass. And so we can see here that there are two essential uh, elements that were at play here in order for conception to take place in the ground in order for that, that crop or for the, for the plants to, to spring forth. The first was the seed. The seed at the beginning was the word of God. So they had to be seed and they had to be the ground. They had to be seed for the grass to bring forth, to, to come forth, for the trees, for the herbs to, to come forth out of the ground. There had to be some kind of seed that was sown into the ground. And then essentially they had to be the ground to carry out the instruction that God had given it to bring forth grass. And so we see that both the seed and the ground carry the instruction of God, the instruction that came by the spoken word of God, the instruction that came as the seed of the word of God. So the seed is the, uh, that God, uh, that God, the instruction that God gave to the earth to bring forth grass was the seed from which that grass or that herb or that, or all those fruit trees were created from. The seed is, the, is instructed to contain or to carry the genetic makeup of all the plant life as we know it today. So in, in his initial instruction, God says, let the earth bring forth grass. And when he spoke about grass, he was speaking of a genetic uh, makeup of a plant. When he spoke about trees, he was speaking of a genetic makeup of trees of a plant, which became trees and, and, and so on and so forth. And so God, gave this instruction to both the seed, which is his word, and the ground, uh, and the ground, which was the earth, to come together and to bring forth this plant life as we know it today. So the ground is instructed to conceive of the word of God, of the seed of the word of God, while the seed is instructed to take root in the ground so that the ground can bring forth after the seed's own kind. So it's only when the instruction to the seed cooperates with the instruction to the ground that we begin to see the plant life coming forth as we know it today. So new life only springs when the instruction that God initially gave to the seed and the instruction that God initially gave to the ground come together to produce the new life that God had promised. So we want to uh, glean a few truths from this, from this passage of scripture that we read both in the New King James and in the NLT. The seed is the word of God for the first creation. So what the earth received on that day initially, what the earth received in order to bring forth grass, in order to bring forth herbs, in order to bring forth fruit trees that would then bring forth fruit with seed of its own kind. The, the, the seed that created the first plant life when there was no physical or natural seed to sow in the ground was the seed of the word of God. And so in that first creation, the seed that brought forth grass, the seed that brought forth herbs, the, the seed that brought forth fruit trees was the seed of the word of God. So without the seed, the earth could not conceive or bring forth plants. The, without the seed of the word of God in that first creation, the earth had nothing to bring forth. Why? Because it had not received uh, any seed in order for it to bring forth. So we begin to see here that the, the earth can only bring forth according to the seed that it received. And because at that time there were no plants, there were no uh, seeds from any plants at the time, nothing was in existence as far as uh, the plant life is concerned, the earth received the seed, which was the word of God, which was the instruction of the word of God. So we see here that without the seed, the earth could not conceive or bring forth. That is why God spoke his word as the initial seed for all the plant life that we know today. We can also see that without the earth, the life in the seed could not be released 
to bring forth after its own kind. So we see here that the earth needs the seed as much as the seed needs the earth. So for the first creation in the Garden of Eden, the seed was the spoken word of God. The earth received the seed of the spoken word of God. And where God spoke grass, the earth received that seed of the word of grass. The, where God spoke herb trees, herbs, the earth received the seed of the word of God uh, named herbs. Where the earth brought forth fruit, fruit trees, the earth had received the seed of the word of God concerning fruit trees. And so we see that for the first creation in Eden, the seed was the spoken word of God. The earth conceived of the spoken word of God, of the seed of the word of God, and then brought forth the original or the initial plant life as we know it today. So the first plants, the first herbs, the first trees, the first grass, were conceived by the earth from the word of God. They were not from the natural seed as we know it, but thereafter, after that first creation, we have learned that the grass would bring forth seed after its own kind. The herbs would bring forth seed after its own kind. The fruit trees would bring forth seed after its own kind. And from that very first grass or the very first herb or the very first fruit trees that came out of the seed of the word of God, some, some seeds would then be carried or created for procreation thereafter. So the initial created creation in the first creation in the Garden of Eden, the seed was the word of God. The earth conceived of the seed of the word of God. Now what happened afterwards, after creation, after the first grass was created, after the first herb was created, after the first tree was created, what happened thereafter? What sustained all that plant life up to today when and we can see and handle the same grass, the same herb trees, the same fruit trees. What sustained that plant life up to now? So the initial seed of the word of God, we said, was at, uh, at the first creation. Now, at the subsequent, subsequent creation, since the beginning, since the beginning, what has been happening? What has sustained that plant life? What has uh, caused that Gra those, those grasses that God initially created to carry through until now, the fruit trees to carry through until now, the herbs to carry through until now. This we hear from Mark 4, verse 26 to 29. Now we are saying since the beginning, the earth has been bringing forth and it will continue to bring forth. But from this passage of scripture, we want to establish what is it that causes the earth to continue to bring forth. Mark 4, verse 26 in the New King James Version, Letty. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Amen. Amen. And in the Amplified, it says, uh, the kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seed upon the ground and then continues to sleep, sleeping and rising night and day while the seed sprouts and grows and increases. But the man uh, knows not how. The earth produces, acting by itself. This, uh, this, this version of the word, really emphasizing emphasizes that it's the earth which produces acting by itself. So the earth from the seed, the earth produces acting by itself and it produces the first, the blade, then the ear, then the full grain on the ear. In the message it says, God's kingdom is like seed thrown on a field by a man who then goes to bed and, for, to bed and forgets about it. The seed sprouts. He has no idea how it happens. So the man has no idea how it happens. And then it goes on to say the earth does it all without the man's help. So we are trying to, 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 to see how the, uh, the seed system works in, in the world as we know it, in the natural world as we know it. So the Bible is telling us here that the earth produces what of whatever seed it receives. The earth 
produces acting by itself without the help of men. The man does not know how the earth does it, but the earth is what yields the crops from the seed that is sown in it. And so we can see here again, the two essential components that make conception in the, in the ground happen is the seed and the ground. So we can't have any plant life without a seed and we can't help have any plant life without the ground. We can see also here that both the seed and the ground carry an eternal instruction from God to bring forth anything after its own kind. So the seed is instructed to contain or carry the genetic makeup of whatever plant life we're talking about, whether it be grass, whether it be tree, fruit trees, whether it be herbs, the, the, those, those seeds carry an instruction to produce after themselves or after their own kind. They carry that instruction from God. On the other hand, the earth also carried an, carries an instruction, an eternal instruction to conceive of whatever seed is sown in it and produce after the seed's own kind. So we can see here that it's only when the instruction given to the seed matches the instruction given to the earth that life springs forth in the form of a plant uh, from a seed that appears to die or from a seed that appears to rot when it's placed in the ground. So the Bible is telling us here that the process is automatic. It's, why is it automatic? Because the, both the elements, both the seed and the earth are acting automatically according to the instruction that God initially gave to both the seed and the earth in the garden of of eden so the process is automatic we don't know we don't understand how it works but it works so god says this is the place where you have to put my your faith in what in my word this is the this is where you are required to just believe what I have told you, what to just believe and to cooperate with the system that works in the kingdom of God. How? By so using the seed and the ground to get the harvest that God only assures. So we can see here that in the procreation or in the uh, uh, in, in the regenerate, regeneration of life forms as we know them today, Without the seed, the earth cannot conceive to bring forth. But without the earth, the life in the seed cannot be released to produce after its own kind either. So the two need each other. The seed needs the earth and the earth needs the seed. A story is told of some um, seeds that were found um, in one of the pyramids in Egypt. Apparently those seeds were 4,000 years old. They were as they did not change form, they did not change structure, they continued to be seed for the 4,000 years that they spent in those pyramids. But when that seed was taken and it was planted in the ground, that spring, that, that seed uh, brought forth, the earth brought forth from that seed, the plant life according to the seeds, uh, uh, according to the seeds that were sown. And so we can see here from that example of this seed that was in the, in the pyramid for 4,000 years, that as long as it remained outside of the ground, it could not reproduce after its own kind. But the moment it was put in the ground, when the instruction in the seed met the instruction in the ground, life sprang forth. And so um, the, the, in the first creation, we say the initial seed that the, uh, that the earth conceived of was the spoken of word. Uh, spoken word of God, but thereafter, thereafter, when the plant life had become, when God saw the sea, the, the, the grass, when God saw the, the herb trees, when God saw the fruit trees and those trees and, and all other plants began to uh, give forth uh, fruit with seed in itself to bring forth after its own kind, then the process of procreation started as God designed it. Every seed that was formed from that moment onward carried the instruction from God to bring forth in, uh, uh, things of the same genetic makeup as the seed itself once that seed was lodged in the ground, which itself received an instruction to bring forth from God after the kind of life of every seed that is, uh, that is lodged in the ground. So thereafter, the seed of the word of God remained. It continues to sustain all the plant life as we know it today, except that that seed is hidden at the core of every seed that we see naturally, the seed of an avocado, the seed of a, 
of an apple, the seed of an orange, right inside, at the inside, the hidden part of that seed is the spoken word of God. What is that spoken word? That every seed will bring forth of its own kind. So every seed that we uh, that we see or that we handle carries in, in, in the hidden part of it, the spoken word of God to bring forth after its own kind. The ground on the other hand continues to carry the instruction of the word of God to cause the seed to bring forth after its own kind once lodged in the ground. So when the earth continues to conceive of the seed of the word of God, then the plant life as we know it continues to be sustained from generation to generation. And the earth will continue to bring forth after the seed's own kind uh, to sustain the, the creation of God from generation to generation. Why? Because the instruction of that God gave in the beginning has not been taken back. So it's that instruction that God gave to the seed that instruction that God gave to the ground that causes uh, the plant life to continue regenerating and procreating from generation to generation, dating back to that first day when God's word was the initial seed from which all the plant life was going to be conceived in the ground. So we can see here from this passage of scripture that what Jesus is saying is that God has given an instruction to both the seed and the earth to bring forth or to yield from the earth as the earth produces by itself, whatever genetic makeup is carried in the seed that is uh, planted in the earth. So we can see here again that the process of procreation involves the seed which uh, carries the spoken word of God and the earth which also carried the spoken, carries the spoken word of God, those instructions coming together, producing life uh, in, in different forms in, um, in, in our lives. And so we can see that in the first creation, it took the seed of the spoken word of God and the seed of the instruction to the earth to bring forth the plant life as we know it today. And ever since that first creation, it also takes the seed of the spoken word of God, which is carried in the natural seed as we know it, coming together with the seed of the spoken word of God instructed to the earth, which is given, which causes the earth to bring forth uh, every seed after its own kind. So we can see here that the earth brings forth, is the earth which brings forth, the seed carries the genetic makeup. So that is how God created everything to work. Now we want to see, um, how that seed can bring forth once it's planted um, in the in the ground is this, it, will it bring forth if it's planted for a day will it, will it bring forth if it's planted for an hour will it bring forth if it's planted for a minute how how has God designed this natural system as we know it to work and remember that we are trying to understand it so that we can begin to apply it to our own lives as we cooperate with God in his kingdom, using the seed as the word of God, uh, uh, cooperating with God as the sower, using his seed as, his, um, as the word of God and allowing our hearts to be the grounds that bring forth just as the earth is bringing forth here. And so we want to see from John 12, verse 24 to 25 in the message translation, we want to hear what, what is the requirement as far as the seed staying in the ground um, is concerned? What is that? What is required for the seed to eventually bring forth for the sorry for the earth to eventually bring forth after the seed's own kind in the ground? John 12, verse 24 to 25 in the message. Listen carefully, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world. It is never any more than a grain of wheat, but if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. Amen. Amen. So um, in the message translation, it uses the word buried. So it's saying when that seed is planted in the ground, it must remain buried, meaning it must stay there. It must be planted and it must stay there. It must be buried in the ground and it must appear dead to the world. Uh, how does it appear dead to the world? Because 
it starts to it, it begins to look like it's rotting. Uh, if you if you if you observe what happens to a seed that has stayed in the ground for a reasonable length of time, it begins to 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 to. It, it looks like it's rotting. It looks like it's dead. It, it looks like it's lifeless. But it's in that lifelessness that God performs a miracle through the earth, causing that seed which is dead or appears to be dead to, to sprout and to reproduce after its own kind many times over. This is what the Bible is saying. And so we, are, we can see here that for the seed to bring, for the earth to bring forth from the seed, after the seed's own kind, that seed must stay buried. It must continue to be hidden in the ground. And I like how um, uh, David puts it in Psalms 119 verse 11. Uh, we're talking about the seed staying buried or the seed staying hidden in the ground in order to reproduce. Uh, he, uh, uh, David says, your word have I hidden in my heart. So he's capturing what what we are trying to talk about here, what we are trying to learn from the word, that that word being the seed must be sown by God and it must be buried in our hearts. And when that seed is buried in our hearts, God's assurance is that it will not bring forth sin it will not bring forth a harvest of the dark world. It will not bring forth a harvest of, of deception and lies. It will only bring forth a harvest of the God kind. It will bring forth a blessing. It will bring forth life in all its abundance. It will bring forth peace. It will bring forth prosperity. It, it will bring forth um, what the, the genetic makeup of the seed that is sown in our hearts. So David knew a thing or two. He knew that once he received the word of God, he had to hide it in his heart so that he can get the, the kind of harvest that God guarantees for anyone who does the same. So in both this, uh, the physical life or the natural life or the natural world as we know it, the seed must be buried or hidden in the earth in order for the earth to bring forth from it. In the same way, the seed of the word of God must be buried in our hearts in order for our has to bring forth after the seed of the word of God's uh, own kind. And so uh, I'm a farmer in my other life, and I always like to, 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 to use the Bible when I'm doing my farming. And um, one thing that they will teach you when you are a, 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 how shall, a novice farmer is that when you plant or when you sow a seed in the ground, you must make sure that the uh, soil and seed contact or the soil and roots contact is very high. So what we do is when we put a seed in the ground or when we transplant uh, a, 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 a seedling into the ground, we press onto the soil around it so that we maximize the contact between the seed or the seedling and the soil and the farmers or the, the, the agronomists will tell you that when that when you maximize that contact, your seed has a very good chance to germinate and to be healthy, or your seedling has a very good chance to settle and to start to grow. So the contact between the seed and the soil, or the contact between the seedling and the soil determines the success of your crop. And so I always used to ask, why do I have to press the ground? So the first reason was that the contact must be almost 100%. It, uh, that gives the plant or the crop a very good chance to thrive. The second reason, or the second reason they always give us for 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 pressing down on the on the on the seed or on the soil around the seed or the or the seedlings roots is that we need to take away any air pockets or any uh, loose running liquids of water or fluids because if we leave air pockets or water, uh, a water barrier between the seed and the, and the soil, the seed will actually just rot and die sometimes, or the seedlings roots will start to rot and to die. And so the reason why we must compact the soil around the seed or and the roots of the seedling is that we want to maximize that contact so that nothing comes between the seed or the seedling and the earth. Why? Because it's to the earth that God gave the instruction to bring forth after the seed's own kind. So in the same way that the seed must be buried or hidden in the earth in our natural world or in our natural gardens, the seed of the word of God must also be buried in the ground of 
for our hearts so that it begins to bring forth. And when something is buried, you don't bury it and you open it again. You don't, when we, when we bury people in the, in the graveyards, we bury them once and for all. We never go back and uh, dig up and see, to try and see, oh, is he still there or whatever. We just bury the, the dead and we forget about it. And that is the kind of approach that God is wanting us to take concerning his word. He wants us to bury that word in the hearts, in, in the soul of our hearts and keep it buried. And it's only when we keep it buried that it begins to bring forth life. The heart begins to bring forth life out of that seed of the word of God. And it, it begins to manifest in our in our in our soul in our spirits in our souls and in our bodies the like god kind of life the zoe kind of life the life of nothing missing nothing broken that is the kind of life that god has in store for us and that life comes packaged in the genetic makeup of the seed of the word of god so god provides the seed God is the sower. He provides us with the seed. It's up to us to bury it, to keep it buried in the soil of our hearts so that it begins to bring forth. We are comparing the natural system of our earthly gardens to the supernatural system of our spiritual gardens. And so this is the reason why we always find instructions in the word to keep the word of God buried in our hearts. Why? Because it's the only way that it's the only way by which the ground of our hearts can bring forth the God kind of life in our lives. Uh, in Proverbs 4, verse 20 to 22, it's an instruction from a father to a son. He says, my son, attend to my words, incline your ear to my, to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. And then he goes on to say, keep them in the midst of your heart. In other words, this father is saying, keep these words buried in your heart, in the ground of your heart. This father knew something. He knew that every word that is buried, that is kept buried in the heart of men, the heart is equipped by the instruction of God to bring forth from that word everything after its own kind. And so this is an instruction to a father uh, from, from a father to his son. He says, keep the words buried in the midst or, or in the innermost part of your heart. He's telling us that the heart is the ground, the word is the seed. And when the word is buried in the ground, the ground has been equipped by God or it has been capacitated by God to cause whatever seed of the word that is hidden in it, in it to bring forth after its own kind. In Joshua 1 verse 8, it, it, um, this is um, an instruction to Joshua, uh, from God, he says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. We know that the part of us that meditates is our heart. In other words, the instruction is for the for that book of the law of, of, of or for that word to be hidden in the heart of men, that men continue to meditate on it, to keep it hidden in their hearts and to continue to meditate on it. And then the promise at the end of it is that God guarantees our success, our good success and prosperity, as long as we keep that word hidden in our hearts. So much like in our natural lives, where when we sow seed in the earth, we must keep it hidden, we must keep it buried, so that the earth can then bring forth out of it. It's the same in our, in our spiritual lives. God is saying, when we receive the word on healing, when we receive the word on prosperity, when we receive the word uh, of salvation, we must receive it in the ground of our hearts. We must keep it buried there. And then God, by his instruction that he has given to the hearts and the seed, to our hearts and to the seed that is lodged in there, he will give the harvest of the God kind of life in, in every aspect of our lives. And so we are still talking about the earth and the heart. We are still comparing the two, the natural system and the supernatural system so that we can begin to understand how to engage or to apply the principles that we are, that we are learning in sowing the seed of the word of God in the ground of our hearts. In John 12, verse 24 to 25, um, sorry, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35, yes, 35 to 38, um, we see that once buried, the earth is responsible for transforming the seed into a plant. So it's only once the seed is buried in the earth that the earth can then carry out God's instruction to transform that seed into plant life as we know it today. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35 to 38, Letty. 
But someone may ask, how would the dead be raised? What kind of bodies would they have? What a foolish person. When you put a seed in the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that you grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you're planting. Then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Amen. Amen. So um, Apostle Paul is addressing the issue of um, life after death, uh, but he, it, it, it's a spiritual question that he was trying to address, but, but he goes back to use the natural system, the, the seed system that we are talking about today in order to explain what happens after death. And so he's saying when you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. So he's saying the seed is put into the ground, it is buried in the ground, it appears to die. And then um, what comes out of the, of the ground as a result of that apparent death of the seed in the ground is a plant. It is not just a seed it becomes a plant because what happens when that, when that seed interacts with the soil, uh, God gives that seed a new body and a plant grows from the seed. And so Apostle Paul is explaining here the, the exact, same, exact same principle that I'm trying to explain that when seed is lodged in the ground, God has created it in such a way that the ground receives that seed. The seed must remain buried it appears to die, but we know that it doesn't die because we know that the earth is doing something according to what God instructed it to do, to break down the seed to the point that the life that is locked in the seed is released and the earth then brings forth this plant, which is totally different from the seed that was sown. And so uh, uh, in the message translation, it says, we do have a parallel experience in gardening. So God is referring us to a system that we all know, a system that we have all used. And he goes on to say, you plant a dead seed, soon there is a flourishing plant. There is no visual likeness between the seed and the plant. You could never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at a tomato seed. What we plant in the soil, that is the seed, and what grows out of it, that is the plant, don't look anything alike. And so Apostle Paul is trying to tell us that what we bury in the ground comes up with a resurrection life and the, the two are dramatically different. And so God has given the earth an instruction to bring out this miracle that is locked up in a seed in something that is totally different from the seed. It brings out something that is alive and thriving from a seed that appears to be dead or dying. So the seed carries um, all the life, but although it carries all the life, it can't release that life that it carries all by itself. Why? Because God has instructed the ground to participate in that process. It's only the ground that has the power to release or to unleash the life that is locked up in all the seas that we know. So the ground is empowered to release the life form that comes contained in, contained in a seed, which the seed itself cannot produce or cannot release uh, independently from the ground. So as long as they are not planted in the earth, the seeds remain dormant. I spoke about those seeds that were found in the pyramids in Egypt. They were dormant for 4,000 years. Why? Because they were not in contact with the ground, which was also given the instruction to release the life form that is carried in the seed. So the earth always produces of the seeds own kind only if the seed remains buried in the earth. The seed must remain buried in the earth in order for the earth to draw out the life from the seed and release the plant life as we know it today. And that is why um, it's very important for that seed to remain buried in the ground. It's, it's so important that the word of God in like manner remains buried in our hearts in order for, 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 the, for our hearts to bring forth after the seed of the word of God, uh, that it, uh, the word that God has given concerning any aspect of our lives. So one other uh, truth that we must learn from this plant 
uh, this seed system or the seed principle um, that God is using to tell us the spiritual truth concerning our interaction with uh, with his word, which is the seed in, in the kingdom of God, is that the earth's indifference, um, the earth has been programmed to just bring forth from any seed that it receives. And this, the earth doesn't decide, oh, this is a bad seed, I'm not going to bring forth from it. This is a good seed, I'm going to bring forth for it, from it. The earth is just instructed to bring forth from any seed that is planted in it and that remains buried in it. And for that, we're going to read from Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30, let it. Another parable you put forth to them saying, the kingdom, of both grow, sorry, the kingdom of let, um, is that uh, how it's supposed to read? No, I think, um, I think there's an error in that. I don't know, but anyway, it's talking about the kingdom of God. I think that I'm, I'm not sure there was a corruption in that copy. The kingdom of God, um, let's read from Matthew 13 on the, I'll just read from my, do you have your yes uh, let me read from my bible please yes hold on it's matthew 13 this 24 to 30. yes 24 to 30. all right Another parable he set forth before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while he was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed also Daniel weeds resembling wheat among the wheat and went on his way. So when his plants sprouted and formed grain, the Daniel weeds also appeared and the servants of the owner came to him and said, say do you not sow good seed in your field then how does it have done those shoots in it he replied to them an enemy has done this and the servants said to him then how do you want us to go on and weed them out but he said no List the, the gathering in the wild wheat, weeds resembling wheat, you uproot the true wheat along with it. Let them grow together until the harvest. At the harvest time, I will say to the reapers, gather the dano first and bind it in bundles to be burned, but gather to the wheat on my granary. Amen. Amen. So in the New King James, we read that there was a man who went and he sowed good seed in his field. Uh, and the Bible says when he slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, which is bad seed, uh, in the same field, the same garden. So we have the owner gardener and the uh, imposter gardener coming. The owner gardener comes with the good seed of the gospel of God, of Christ. The, 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 the imposter gardener comes with the lies and the deceit of, uh, of Satan, and both seeds are sown in the same ground. This is what uh, Jesus, this is what this parable is talking about. And he's saying, um, when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, so the grain is the good seed that the owner gardener, who is God or Jesus, has sown in the ground of our hearts, it sprouted and it produced crop. But it also goes on to say the tares also sprouted and they also appeared. So the same ground received two different seeds from the owner gardener and the imposter gardener, the same ground produces from both seeds, both the grain and the tares. So they both grew in the same, in the same garden or in the same earth or in the same ground. So what, what is Jesus trying to tell us here? He's telling us that both the good and the bad seed will sprout. The ground does not discriminate between the seed. As long as the seed is planted in the heart or in the ground, the ground's instruction is just to bring forth. And so we see from this parable that the ground doesn't discriminate between the seed. It doesn't refuse to, to, to sprout the, the, the bad seed. It doesn't cooperate only with the good seed. The ground is just instructed to bring forth from whatever seed is planted 
and remains buried in it. So it receives both the bad seed and the good seed equally. It treats both the bad seed and the good seed equally. It conceives of both the bad seed and the good seed equally. And so we can see from this uh, passage of scripture that the earth or the ground is indifferent to the type of seed that is sown in it. Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't discriminate, it doesn't pick and choose, it doesn't select, it just brings forth from every seed that is planted in it. And in, in this parable, Jesus is trying to, talk, to show us that our hearts, just like the earth, are programmed by God to bring forth of whatever seed we allow to be planted in, in them. And so the earth is indifferent to the type of seed sown. And so we, we see here that as the seed is to the earth, so the word is to the to our hearts. So the seed is to the earth what the word of God is to the ground of our hearts. So in Mark 4, verse 15, 14 to 15, we see we, we read that it's the sower who sows the word. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. In Mark 4, verse 14 to 15, the sower sows the word, and that what uh, Jesus marries now the physical sowing of uh, of the of 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 the natural seeds as we know them, and the spiritual sowing of the word of God as we know it in the ground of our heart. So he's saying the sower who sows the word, um, sows that word in our hearts. So our hearts become the ground into which the word is sown. In Luke 8, verse 11 to 12, it says the seed is the word. Uh, and those by the wayside are those who hear when then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts. So it's implied in those passages of scripture that the word is sown in the ground of our heart. So as the seed is to the earth, the word is to the heart. So as seed is to the earth, the word is to our heart. So just as the earth conceives of the seed that is sown in it, our hearts also conceive of the seed that is sown in it, either good or bad. Just as the earth allows both the good and the bad seed to bear fruit, our hearts also allow both the good and the bad seed to bear fruit, fruit in our lives. And just as the ground brings forth, our hearts will also bring forth. Once sown, the seed must remain buried in the earth in order to procreate or regenerate. In the same way, once the word of God is sown in our hearts, it must remain buried in order for it to bring forth uh, after its own kind in our lives. So both the earth and the heart only bring forth after the seed's own kind, whether the seed is good, in which case the, the, the earth and the heart will both bring forth a good harvest, or the seed is bad, in which case both the earth and the heart will bring forth a bad harvest. So what we can see here is that the natural system, the, the natural principle by which the seed and the earth relate to produce a harvest or a crop is the same supernatural uh, principle by which in the kingdom of God, the word of God in interacts with our hearts to produce the God kind of harvest in our lives. Now we are going to compare the womb to the heart. We've just finished comparing the, the, the earth to, the, to our hearts the earth being the natural ground or the natural uh, garden and our hearts being the spiritual or supernatural garden in which the seed of the word of God is sown. Now we are going to compare that heart to the womb. Uh, for that, we're going to read from Ruth 4 verse 13, just to see how conception happens in the natural womb, in naturally in, in the womb of a woman. Uh, let it, Ruth 4 verse 13, please. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Amplified. Mm -hmm. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. In the message, Boaz married Ruth, she became his wife, Boaz slept with her, by God's gracious gift, she conceived and had a son. Amen. Amen. So in this passage of scripture, we see natural conception as we know it. We can see here that Boaz's uh, seed was uh, had to be conceived in the womb of Ruth so that she bore a son. And then in the message, it says God's gracious gift. So it, it, it begins to show us the hand of God in the miracle that, of life that happens when Ruth uh, conceived of the seed 
uh, from 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 Boaz in order. That in order to bring forth a son. So the process of, of conception that is being talked about here is the process of becoming pregnant in the in our natural lives. Uh, and that process of becoming pregnant involves the fertilization and the implantation of the embryo in the womb of a woman. And then it, 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 uh, when we allow it the uh, sufficient incubation in time, which is nine months, a child is born. So uh, this is what, how it happens in the, in the, in the natural world. Now, we will see further that the word God is telling us that the kingdom of God works in much the same way. He's taking a natural uh, uh, system or principle and applying it to our spiritual lives so that we can begin to understand how to, what role we have to play and how to play that role in order to allow uh, the word of God enough gestation time to bring forth of its own kind in our lives. Now we want to see a supernatural conception that uh, Ruth's example was a natural conception to a natural man and a natural woman, which brought, brought forth a very natural uh, child or son. We want to see a supernatural conception which happened to Mary uh, in Matthew 1, verse 18 to 21. We want to see whether it worked the same way as it did for Ruth, whether because the conception in the that we're going to read about now was a supernatural conception did it work the same way and if we if it did then we can conclude that conception is conception and it will work the same way wherever it's found matthew 1 verse 18 to 21 now the birth of jesus christ was as follows after his mother mary was betrothed to joseph before they came together she was found with child of the holy spirit then joseph her husband being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while we thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Amen. Amen. So we find here that the word conceive or conceived or conception comes up again. Um, and um, in this instance, Mary has conceived of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says it's of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And how did you con how did she conceive of the Holy Spirit when she said, "Let it be to me according to your word"? After the angel uh, uh, announced the the, the 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 conception of Jesus, uh, the miraculous conception of Jesus in her womb. So that is how she conceived of the Holy Spirit. She had to conceive of the seed of the word of the angel. So the word of the angel was the seed which. Mary received by faith and conceived of in order for the for the for, for Jesus to be born. And so we see here from this passage of scripture and the previous one when we spoke about when we read about Ruth that there are three critical components to this process. First of all, there needs to be a seed. Uh, that seed must be conceived of in the womb. And once conceived, conceived, that seed must remain buried in the womb and seen and unknown by all. Uh, all the people around until another, uh, until such a time as the pregnancy begins to show, that seed remains buried in there. And what is happening when the seed is buried there? The, it's, it's, uh, we call that the gestation period. That is when the seed is being transformed in that womb supernaturally to, to start to grow uh, a head, limbs, fingers, eyes, etc. Et until that seed or that embryo becomes a full person. That is the miracle that happens, the miracle of life that happens in the womb of a woman. She conceives the seed, she allows a gestation, a gestation period, and then she brings it forth as a whole complete individual. So that process is the process that also happens in our hearts. So God is, Jesus, uh, God is going to show us that this conception that happens in the natural and in the, that happened in the supernatural for Mary is the same conception that must happen in the womb of our hearts. So initially we said the womb, the, our hearts are being compared to the earth or the ground that brings forth after the seeds on kind. Now our hearts are being compared to the womb that receives seed and that conceives of that seed, allows it a gestation 
gestation, uh, gestation period and then brings forth uh, uh, after the, the, the after, after the seeds on kind. And so we, we, we see here that the heart must also conceive just like the womb conceives. Let's see how the heart conceives. Let's see what the Bible says about the heart conceiving of either good seed or bad. James 1 verse 13 to 15. Letty. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when we desire, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Amen. Amen. So um, uh, Apostle James is telling us here that in the same way that the womb conceives of the seed, our hearts also conceive. They conceive of desires or lusts um, that come from the deception of the enemy. They, uh, they conceive of uh, desires or lusts that come as a result of the enticement or the inducement of the enemy. And when our hearts conceive, um, of the bad seed, they will give birth to sin. It says our hearts conceive, we allow that conception, a, gest a gestation period, and it gives birth to seed, uh, to, to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so our hearts are being compared to the womb here. And we want to understand where these desires are located in our anatomy, where are these desires located? Uh, Psalm 37 verse 4 tells us where these desires are located. It tells us to delight ourselves in the Lord and he will give, give us, give you the desires of your heart. So we find from that, from those two, when we read those two scriptures together, we see that the, these desires are located in our hearts. So if these desires are located in our hearts, it's in our hearts, therefore that sin is conceived and it's, in, it's from our hearts that sin then brings forth death. And so we can see here that our hearts are being compared in, in, um, in the sense of conceiving, in the sense of allowing a gestation period, and in the sense of giving birth or giving forth fruit, is our hearts are being compared to the womb or the way the womb of a woman works in receiving seed, allowing the seed to to gestate in it, within it and then bringing forth after the seeds on kind. So our hearts are being compared to the womb. And if we can understand the, the, way, um, the way of procreation facilitated by the womb, we will also be able to understand the way of pro procreation facilitated by our hearts. And so the heart, the heart conceives both the good and the bad. We want to see here, from the word, how the heart can also conceive of the bad seed, just like the ground conceived of both the wheat and the tares. We read that earlier on. We are got, for that, we are going to read from Acts 5, verse 1 to 10. Let's see. Acts 5, verse 1 to 10. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it to the apostles feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why a certain feud you had to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And, if, and after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this kind of thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon those who, who heard these things. And the young man arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later, when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is, that, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. 
and will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead, carrying her out and buried her by her husband. Amen. Amen. We are not going to be talking about the theology of that, <laughs> of this passage of scripture, but I just want us to zero in on um, the, the, the words highlighted in red. He said, Peter says to Ananias, uh, to Ananias, he, you have conceived this thing in your heart. What is it that Ananias conceived in his heart? The Bible tells us that Satan had filled his heart with the lie. So Satan filled, uh, gave words of lies to Ananias. Ananias con and, and Sapphira conceived them in their hearts and the result of it was death. And so we can see here that the heart is capable of conceiving the seed of satanic lies as much as it is capable of conceiving of the seed of the word of God. And so I'm sure it's becoming clearer in our minds and in our hearts now that our hearts are like a womb. They just receive whatever seed is sown in them, just like the earth receives the seed of whatever is sown in it. As long as that seed continues to be buried in the hearts or in the soil, that seed will bring forth of its own kind, whether good or bad. So in this example, Satan filled the hearts of Ananias and, Sa and Sapphira with a lie. They conceived of that lie in their heart and they participated with, participated with it to the full. And the result was that was death in their case. And so we see here that the heart acts just like the womb in reproducing of spiritual life in the same way that the womb reproduces of physical or natural life. life. So seed is to the womb what the word is to the heart. Earlier on, we, 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 we concluded that seed is to the earth what the word is to the heart. Now we are concluding that seed, in this case, sperma or um, uh, the seed of a man is to the womb what the word of God is to the heart. So the heart is like the womb that brings forth the seed of the word of God, just like the womb brings forth the seed of a man to, um, and brings forth a child uh, out of that. So as seed is to the womb, so the word is to the heart. And just as the womb conceives, the heart also conceives. It, just as the womb brings forth, the heart also brings forth. Once the seed is sown, the seed must remain buried in either the womb or the heart in order for it to procreate or to bring forth. And in the same way, once the seed of the word of God is sown in the heart of men, it must remain buried in, men, in men's heart in order to bring forth after its own kind. So I'm hoping, I'm really hoping and praying that is, it's now very clear in our hearts and in our minds, how our hearts are just the same as the soil in God's scheme of things and how our hearts are so important in bringing forth the seed of the word of God after its own kind in the rest of, uh, of our lives. And I'm also hoping that we have come to the conclusion that our hearts operate just like the womb of a woman operates in receiving seed, conceiving of it, allowing it a gestation period and then bringing forth or procreating or regenerating after the seeds on kind for all men to see around us. And that is the end of our teaching today. We'll take it up from there next, next week. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mack for that powerful uh, teaching. Uh, indeed, we have been blessed. Um, I have two questions though. Um, the first one is emanating from um, the, the, the teachings that you did initially where you said bury the word of God in your heart and keep, keep it buried and it will bring forth. Then uh, my question there is how do we uproot um, this word? Let's say what actions can I do to uproot this word Let, uh, that I would have buried so that I don't uproot the word in my heart. Okay, so remember we did uh, a series earlier on um, the seven pillars of a faith that overcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we spoke about the, the seven pillars that cause our faith to work. And remember that the word is the, is, is the source of all faith. So in mm -hmm. other words, when we are talking about 
uh, the seven pillars that make our faith work, we could actually say the seven pillars that cause the word of God to remain buried in our hearts. So the first pillar I think we spoke about was the word of God itself, staying in the word, studying the word, meditating on the word. The, and and uh, when we're, we're studying the word or meditating on the word, uh, we, we do it in different ways. There's a systematic study of the word of God where you're just reading from Genesis to Revelation in an orderly fashion. Uh, that is a systematic a way to read the word. That is how you can keep the word buried in your heart. And um, th what I like about that systematic approach is that it gives you a sense of what seed you have in the word. Uh, it, it tells you what is in your bag of seeds, basically. And then another way to study the word that can keep the word rooted in your heart is uh, by uh, topical studies. When you're reading about kingdom finances, for example, when you're reading about healing, when you're reading about uh, marriage and relationships, you are doing topical studies, you're keeping the word uh, hidden in your heart. And then you could do another way is to do a word study, where when you're talking about salvation, for example, you study the word to see what that word means. You, and then you find out that it means forgiveness of sin, but not only forgiveness of sin, it means healing for our bodies. It means uh, physical and emotional prosperity. It also means freedom and on and on like that. So as you do a word study, you are keeping the word hidden in your heart. And then the fourth way to study the word is meditation. We read about it, um, in, um, in Joshua 1 verse 8 and Proverbs 4 verse 20, I think somewhere there, where the instruction is to meditate on the word of God. Meditating on the word of God means musing over the word of God, considering the scriptures and applying them in your life, engaging your mind in, uh, in, de de in deciding what the word uh, the word that God has given you would translate to in your life. So for example, when the, when the word talks about healing, it's envisioning yourself in your mind uh, healed, live in envisioning yourself doing all the things that you would want to do um, if you are living a healthy life. And so that is, those are the four ways to keep the word hid, hidden in, in our hearts. And um, praying in tongues is another way. Uh, med, uh, keeping in fellowship is another way. Uh, meditating on the love of God is another way. And on and on and on and on like that. So it's just doing daily things, doing things daily that keep you, that keep the word of God at the core or at the fore or as the focus of your mind. That is how you can keep the word of God hidden in your heart. Wow, thank you so much. Um, then the second question um, is coming from the scripture that I had to read from my phone. I forgot the, uh, the, the address to it, but it was basically saying both good and bad seed was proud. Mm -hmm. uh, then the question from that is, let's say I, I know in my heart that there's bad seed that I have sown and I want it out. Is, is there a way of having a premature, like um, con, uh, what do you call this, miscarriage or of that um, seed that is bad? Oh, we just wait for the harvest. <laughs> okay. Yes. No, no, no. You don't, you don't have to harvest every bad seed that you have allowed to be sown in your hearts. And God has provided a way, and that way is called repentance. Um, when I have sown bad seed in my heart, all I have to do is go to God in repentance and receive his mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is God withdrawing from us, withholding from us the punishment that is truly due to us. So when I have allowed a bad seed to be sown in my heart, I can first of all repent of it, and then I can receive mercy. Uh, the Bible tells us that we can find grace to help in time of need. Um, we can, I can receive mercy for, for that bad seed that I've allowed to, 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 to be planted in my heart. And but as I repent of it, and as I receive mercy um, instead of judgment from God, crop failure will happen. So that, that seed will not germinate, it will not uh, thrive, and it will definitely not bring forth the, seed, the, the fruit of death in my life. So repentance um, and uh, receive, uh, running back to the mercy of God uh, is how we can avert uh, bad fruit, bad, bad seed uh, from producing death in our lives. Wow, thank you, Mrs. Meg. That was so insightful. Uh, since we have come to that part of our service that is um, unique, 
where you can contribute your questions. If you have other additions that you want to um, put in, you can uh, type in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, but before I call upon anyone, I just want to read a couple of messages uh, from the chat. Uh, Apostle uh, Paul is saying powerful teaching and awesome practical examples to Mrs. Mack. Then Mr. Mack is saying, uh, he quoted Luke 6 verse 45, which says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bring forth good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speak. Amen. Amen. Saints, uh, you can contribute. Mr. Mac, you can come through. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for the word, Ashtag Suti. Um, it was quite clear as it was coming to me that the word, this, the word is a seed, yes. And that, that word, as, as I plant the word of God, as I, I walk with God, as I receive his messages, and as I, I, I understand his principles, then that word will develop and grow in my heart. But the, the, the principles of God are so clear and they work all the time, seed, time, and harvest. So whatever I plant, I will harvest. And so what, what's, what's very clear here is whatever I sow or plant in my life, that I will also harvest in my life. So if I plant love, I'll get love. If I plant, plant joy, I get joy. If I plant kindness, I'll get kindness. In all different ways, that is what I'll harvest in my life. But at the same time, if I plant peace, yes, I get peace. If I plant deception, I'll also, at one point in my life, reap deception. If I plant meanness, at one point in my life, I'll then harvest meanness. If I plant strife in my life, I will then at some point in my life, harvest strife. So it's very critical, it's very important to know what type or what kind of seed I plant. So I think we all want peace, we want joy, we want happiness. And the word, which is the word of God, which brings that peace that surpasses all understanding, that joy, that peace, is then what brings us the happiness, the joy and the peace at the end, if we planned it, if we planned it in our lives. And like, like hashtag Mrs. Mark was saying, as, he, as it's planted, you'd like it very, the seed to be very close to the, to the, to the earth, to get the nutrients that then the earth produces, the, or the earth will then produce the harvest, that, 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 that kind of seed, uh, uh, um, um, is supposed to produce a mango tree, a mango tree, a thorn tree, thorns. Now, I think the, the only way for me to keep close, like the seed keeps close to the earth, is for me to keep close to the word of God, to stay in the word, and then I will harvest. I think so, sometimes, unfortunately, when we look at the world, we see people planting bad seed, and apparently they appear to be very happy. Apparently, I'm saying apparently. And unfortunately, that confuses our minds. I think the devil is working on us. Whatever one plants, they will harvest, they will reap. But you know what? Who feels it knows it. They might not say. So we must keep and believe in the word that whatever I plant, I get out. So I want to plant and I need to plant good seed. So that's the message I got. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mac. Indeed, the world will appear like as if they're happy, planting bad seed and all, but the truth is people don't really say what is on their hearts, even if they're struggling. Nobody will say, they'll just post pictures of being happy and all, and will be confused. Let us not, let us not really get confused on that and remember that the word of God is truth. Mm. Uh, we have a message from uh, Terry Nyemba. And they're saying the word is very touching and simplified in a manner that we should grow the good seed in our hearts and pluck out the bad weeds. So, so we have a good harvest. 
This week will be a blessed and amazing week. Amen. Thank you, Terry, for that. Um, we have a hand from Faina. Faina, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, Letty, and thank you very much, Mrs. Mack, for this uh, powerful, powerful word that's really tying in with the seed, uh, the message of the seed that you've been teaching us and about the issue of the heart. And I think uh, I think the word always, uh, it's always commending us to always guard our hearts. And I think that's how we are asked to guard our hearts because it says out of our hearts comes is issues of life. And that guarding is actually how we we are protecting or keeping the word down in the soil so that it, it, it starts the process that you're talking about. So it's really guarding our hearts. Uh, and I think I always ask that question that how do we guard our hearts? And you did talk about how we are staying in community, we're in the word and staying there. But I think if we further need to actually be radical about guarding this heart by actually um, watching what we're exposing ourselves to. Um, it could be in TV, like it's just what we are watching TV, what we, the conversation we get into, um, what we say after we've received all that is, is some of the things that we actually do that actually makes us uh, uproot the, the seed. Because sometimes we feel like uh, I've received this word, like we've received this word today and we go on on our day, we go to work, do what we want to do. I watch whatever I want to watch. I, I just have conversations with what, but in conversation, in watching, in wherever I am, the surroundings that I'm exposing myself, I'm actively uprooting that seed because I'm not guarding what I'm exposing myself to. So it's a very practical way of, of actually uh, you've given us steps practically on how to actually see the manifestation or the harvest of whatever seed we've put in our hearts so that we actually see it coming out. Because if we don't guard our hearts, like the word says, we are definitely not going to see anything uprooting because of our lifestyle actually uproots that seed. So we, I think it's very practical in saying if I'm seeing a fruit that I don't like in my life, I've got a responsibility to guard my heart because the seed has been given. I take it in, I receive it in my heart. My part is to guard, how am I guarding? There are things I can do for the word, which is being in the word, meditation, fellowship, speaking in tongues, like you, you taught us in the world, uh, old world of a coming faith. But there's also things I can do to uproot that, that seed in terms of the association, the lifestyle, the words I say, the things I just let in in my heart. So I thank you very much. This was a very practical lesson for us to be able to actually see the, to live the abundant life that Scar was talking about in, in, in communion so that we are not always being Christians that are about talking about this life, but we're actually, we're talking about a life that we're experiencing through our lives. So thank you very much for this practical lesson. And I, I, I was thoroughly blessed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Faina. Indeed, we need to be practical about our Christian lives. Uh, since I don't see any other contribution, uh, don't go home with any other questions or, or comments that you want to, to say because you are shy or whatever, you can just type. Um, anyway, uh, I will invite Mrs. Meg back to wrap up the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Letty. So um, in conclusion, um, I just want to go over what we have already gone over concerning the earth, the womb, and the heart. Um, initially, we said the seed is to the earth what the word is to the heart. The seed works the same way in the earth as the word works in our hearts. And the earth causes seed to bring forth in the same way that our heart will cause the word of God to bring forth in our hearts. So in our lives. So a seed is to the soil, so the word is to the heart. And as seed causes the soil to bring forth, the word will also cause our hearts to bring forth. The word is uh, programmed, that the, the heart is programmed that way and the word is programmed that way as well. In both cases, the process is totally automatic and it is sustained by God's spiritual laws or God's instruction or God's initial instructions uh, in the beginning. So the seed depends on the sower or the gardener and the seed determines the harvest. So the seed that is going to be sown in our hearts is determined by the sower that we allow to sow in our hearts. So if we allow God to be the singular sower in our hearts, he's going to sow the seed of the word of God, which will lead to a harvest of life. But if we allow the imposter gardener who is Satan to sow into our hearts, he's going to sow the seed of lies and deceit and deception, 
and it's going to lead to a harvest of death like we saw in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. So both the ground and the heart are indifferent to the seed that is sown in it. The ground and the heart both just bring forth from whatever seed is sown. And it is up to us, first of all, to decide on the seed that is going to be sown in our hearts. It is up to us to take care of the bad seed that we have allowed in error to be sown into our hearts. It is up to us to be the stewards of the hearts that God has given us. Uh, and like Fainai uh, said in, in her comments, it is up to us to guard that heart, guarding it from seed that is from the enemy territory, seed that will lead to a harvest of death, and guarding it so that the seed of life that is hidden in it is not lost through our confessions, through our associations, and through anything that we might do to uproot the good seed that is already sown in our hearts. And the second bit of my conclusion, we're still talking about the earth, the womb, and the heart, is that uh, just a reminder that just as the seed of man is to the womb, the word of God is to the heart. So our heart is being compared to the womb. And just as conception happens only in the womb, conception also happens Conception of the word of God in the kingdom of God only happens in the heart. So in both the womb and the heart, time must lapse to allow the incubation uh, to, to take place. And that time, that time that must lapse is the time during which the word is hidden or buried in our heart. And as the seed causes the womb to bring forth, the word will also cause, uh, the heart will also cause the word that is hidden, hidden in our hearts to bring forth. And in both cases, in both the case of the womb and, the, uh, and our hearts, the process is completely and totally automatic. It is sustained only by God's spiritual laws. It is God who brings forth the harvest in both cases. Um, and then finally, both the womb and the heart just receive and they bring forth from whatever seed is sown in them. So in both cases, if there's no seed, then there's not going to be any conception. And if there's no conception, then there's not going to be any offspring. And if there's no offspring, then there's not going to be any harvest. And so my, my encouragement to all of us is that we must mind the seed that we allow to be sown in our hearts. It's better to take care of the seed before it's sown than to try and take care of, it, of the seed that is sown and then start try to start to uproot it, try to, uh, to start believing for crop failure. It's always better to, to, nip the, to nip it in the bud at the front end of the process. It's always better to choose the sower that we are going to allow access to our hearts. It's all, and in choosing the sower, we are also choosing the seed that we are going to allow to be sown in our hearts. It's, all, it's, all, it's, it's also important that we keep the good seed buried in our hearts. We don't um, express our unbelief. We don't express our doubts. We don't question God. We don't start to murmur and to complain. It's important that we continue to keep that seed hidden in our hearts, believing in a God who is faithful to cause a harvest to come from it. In, uh, my encouragement is also that we must trust the process. We must trust that God will bring forth a harvest after due time or in due season. And we must also just believe that it will happen without us fully understanding it. We read from the passage in Mark that we know not how the 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 so the man who sowed seed in the ground does not know how that seed becomes becomes transformed to become a plant but whether we know how it works or not is not important the, the most important we must just do it we must so, uh, choose the sower but and by choosing the sower we are choosing the seed once the seed is sown in our hearts we must keep it buried through meditation through prayer praying in tongues once it's buried, we must trust the process, allow the process due time, and we must just continue to do it, and whether we understand it or not. So that is the conclusion of the message today, and that is the word of question that, we, that I have for all of us. Mind the seed, choose it.